Everyone, tonight you are in for such a treat. We are absolutely thrilled to host best-selling author and award-winning researcher, Dr. Lisa Miller, for a discussion on her brand new book release, The Awakened Brain, The New Science of Spirituality and Our Quest for an Inspired Life. Lisa is the New York Times best-selling author of The Spiritual Child and a professor in the clinical psychology program at Teachers College, Columbia University. She is the founder and director of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, the first Ivy League graduate program in spirituality and psychology, and has held over a decade of joint appointments in the Department of Psychiatry at Columbia Medical School. Her innovative research has been published in more than 100 empirical peer-reviewed articles in leading journals, including Cerebral Cortex, the American Journal of Psychiatry, and the Journal of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. She lives in Connecticut with her husband and three children. Also joining us this evening, we are so excited to welcome Susan Kane, world-renowned speaker, named the sixth top influencer in the world by LinkedIn. She is author of award-winning books, Quiet Power, Quiet Journal, and Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. Translated into more than 40 languages, Quiet has appeared on many best of lists, spent more than seven years on the New York Times bestsellers list, and was named the number one book of the year by Fast Company Magazine, which also named Susan one of its most creative people in business. So it's safe to say you are all in for quite an evening. Without further ado, please help me in welcoming to our virtual sage, Dr. Lisa Miller and Susan Kane. Well, uh, Dana, thank you so much for that great introduction. It is a true, true honor for me to be here with Lisa and with all of you tonight. Um, Lisa and I actually met once 10 years ago, and I've kind of followed her career with some awe and reverence ever since. Um, and so I want to say, I'm, I'm going to start by saying that Lisa is obviously you know, a, a true leader and really pathbreaker in her field and, and has conducted incredible research that you're going to be hearing about tonight in the area of spirituality and depression, the neuroscience of, of uh, spirituality and depression, um, and particularly a groundbreaking study that she did in 2012. Um, but I'm going to ask you to hold all of that about Lisa to the side for the moment, to know that it's coming, but to hold it for the side, because I want to start by asking Lisa to share with us kind of where she comes from in life. Um, so Lisa, I want to ask you just to tell us a little bit about your childhood and about what your relationship was to spirituality in your childhood. Because I, I think as is true for so many of us, um, when we look at the work that we do or when we look at other people's work who we truly admire, you can usually trace it back some, some, somehow to the roots of their childhood. And I'm guessing, especially here. So Lisa. Susan, thank you. And I'm so grateful and so honored that we're engaging in a discussion tonight on launch. I have such appreciation for you. Thank you so much. And thank you to RJ Julia and to Random House and to our thought community who's with us. Um, so I, I would say that like every child, I was a very spiritual child, and we now know, if I could just slip one bit of science then, that everyone is born a spiritual child. Um, and I was very grateful that I had parents who supported that. Um, my mother was effectively a religious and spiritual Jew who's best understood as a plain clothed suburban shaman. She had a deep spiritual awareness, and we'd hop in the car and we'd say, hey, mom, we don't have a map. Where are we going? And she'd say, oh, no, you can feel your way. Right? So the sense that intuition is real, you can count on intuition. There's ways of knowing that are non-discursive, non-material, and we can count on them was in the mix from day one. And my father is a very imaginative, deep thinking artist. He's a director of theater. And so as a child, I grew up in the green room. I grew up in the audience. Occasionally, he'd put me in a tiny little child role. The symbolic reality was every bit as valid as the linear reality and the notion that life holds a symbolic truth, the 
you know, events, synchronicities, dreams, who we are to one another has meaning in the deep symbolic sense was part of growing up in the house of a director of theater. And I'll give you just a brief example. As a child, I'd walk down the street and I'd see a manhole and I was thoroughly expecting an actor to rise up through it. And it was kind of a letdown that the manhole stayed static. So the, the world really was animated. Um, I guess that's how it started. And what about today? How would you define the word spirituality? Great. So I would say that as a scientist, um, scientists do not define spirituality, but we identify threads of lived human spiritual life that have an enormous impact on the rest of our lives. And so in the awakened brain, the two threads of lived human spirituality in which I focus are those that have a great deal of robust data around them from 20 years now of science. The first is a deep, innate seat of transcendent awareness that we are all born with this, that it can be developed or not, like by way of analogy as a muscle, but a deep sense of transcendent awareness that ultimately for most people unfolds as a transcendent relationship with God, the universe, spirit, whatever language might be theirs. And the second important dimension is that that deep transcendent awareness is shared with fellow people and that we see one another as emanations of spirit, children of God, beings of infinite worth, whatever, again, our language might be. But there's an important point in this, which is spirituality is our birthright. It, if we look at twin studies, we see that just as we inherit temperament and yet it can be molded, we also inherit the innate capacity for spiritual awareness and it can be molded. Religion is not a biologically based innate human capacity. Religion is a gift of our ancestors shared by our community. It is entirely environmentally transmitted. In our country, if we might envision an overlapping Venn diagram, about two thirds of people in the United States say I am spiritual and I am religious. For me, my deep transcendent awareness, my sense of life as being sacred, who we are to one another, is held in my faith tradition, our texts, our prayers, our ceremonies, our meditations, our traditions. About 30% of millennials and fewer with each older generation will say I am spiritual, but I am not religious. For me, spirituality is experienced in nature, in poetry and music as I look at my family. So whether or not there is an embrace by a faith tradition, every single one of us is a spiritual being as much as we are physical, emotional, or cognitive beings. I want to make sure I heard that statistic correctly. Did you say as people get older, they're less likely to identify as spiritual and not religious? Oh, thank you. Just you no, you've done so very well, but we also could have used you in the lab because <laughs> there's a very keen point you're raising, which is that is a current statistic based on a cohort effect as opposed to a developmental effect. So the generation that at the moment are Gen Z and millennials, particularly younger millennials, have a higher percentage of people who are self-professed spiritual, but not religious than people who are say 40, 50, 60, 70. So um, thank you for that point of clarification at the moment. No, not at all. I was just surprised to hear because I would have thought it applied to um, the current older generations as well. Um, okay. So let me ask you this. I, I, I want to get into the study that's at the heart of the book before we kind of um, radiate outward from there. But, but um, the study has to do with what you found about spirituality on the one hand and depression on the other. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I'm curious to know, do you think you were driven to this work by um, a fascination for spirituality or by concern about depression? And if so, how did those two influences drive you? Thank you for that thoughtful question. Um, I would say that because the spirituality was never stamped out of me as a child, you know, there's a tendency in a dominant 20th century secular materialist culture to tell children things aren't real, that that dream is only a dream, that that mystical experience was your constructed imagination. And I was very grateful that the transcendent awareness with which we're all endowed was not stamped out of me as a child. So it was very confusing to me. I, could, I mean, I couldn't wait, for instance, as a child to go to school. I could not wait because I woke up each day and out in nature, there was a symphony, you know, the cicadas brought a certain rhythm and the trees felt conscious. And I felt, I loved to pray each morning. So kindergarten, 
sounded like a time where we could talk about that. And I couldn't wait, <laughs> but I got there and not a word was said. <laughs> and so I waited, um, waited in third grade, 10th grade and sat in the front row in college as a psychology major and still nothing was said. And it occurred to me that we had a dominant model of the human experience within mainstream academic culture, within perhaps center field public square in our country that was silent on spiritual life. And that made no sense to me because I had experienced portals opening and I had experienced the transition from suffering to illumination. And I had experienced, you know, so, so where the rubber hit the road was as an intern, I'd finished my PhD, I was in a inpatient unit where there was tremendous suffering. And as I looked at the patient files, some of them were this thick. This was, you know, before computers. Rotating in and out, you know, multiple admissions, five admissions, eight admissions, getting sicker and sicker. And it was simply undeniable that the dominant models of treatment weren't helping these people who were so full of pain. So I listened as many interns do to what patients had to say about their suffering. And what I heard was, you know, Dr. Miller, could you come here, Dr. Miller? And when they told me this very often, there was a sense of privacy that we were doing something secret or off the grid. And some patients would actually lead me, Dr. Miller, down the hall into the kitchen, back behind the table to the pantry to the pots and pans room. And there, far from where anyone else could hear us, they'd say, Dr. Miller, will you pray with me? Dr. Miller, I'm about to be sent upstate, which meant they're not coming back. It was a terminal um, referral. Before I go, will you pray with me? And whatever their faith tradition might be, I knew in my inner wisdom, there was a moral imperative to join them there. It was simply, you know, the truth. And in this case, the woman who was about to be sent upstate, she prayed the rosary. I don't happen to be Catholic. I'm a Jew. She, but she prayed her rosary. And then she said, now, Dr. Miller, will you pray your way? So she didn't want me to pray the rosary. This wasn't about whose faith tradition was at, you know, at play, but join me in this deep reverence, this deep connection to the ultimate source of life and protection and guidance. And I realized then that I would never sell out a patient who wanted spiritual support. And when I moved from the clinic to the lab, my life's work was to help integrate this deep core of renewal, of resilience, of strength that was undeniably in my eye, part of us and part of our possibility for sustenance and, and even in some cases, recovery and renewal. And you had described in your book how even before you moved to the lab, when you were still, I think at the, the place that you were just talking about that you had the idea of holding a religious service, um, and, and you described really beautifully in the book the effect that it had on these patients who had really been struggling, you know, at, at, at the far reaches of what we think human struggle carries us to, um, how transformative that experience was for them. But then I was also really taken by uh, the experience of your colleagues and I guess supervisors who basically took you aside and said, don't tell anybody that you did that don't let anyone know um, because somehow there was something wrong um, with that as a treatment. I don't know if there was something wrong with the doing of it in and of itself or with the naming of it as a treatment protocol. Not sure which. So um, That's true. It was in that same year, in that same inpatient unit, um, which was itself not a last stop, but it's not where someone with resources might have chosen to go. Um, there we were, and it was approaching the high holidays. And it dawned on me that this hospital served a large chunk of Manhattan. Um, there were a number of patients on the inpatient unit who were Jewish, and there didn't seem to be high holiday services. And when this was announced, it was demoralizing. It was disappointing to some of the patients. So I asked the head of the unit, would you allow me, you know, I'm not a rabbi, to come in and as a member of the community, lead a Yom Kippur, facilitate a Yom Kippur service. And they were, you know, to their great credit, first and foremost about helping the patients. And they said, sure, you know, they happened to work within the model of the time, but sure. And what I found was that patients who found each day excruciatingly painful, 
patients who couldn't contain outbursts, who felt loathsome of themselves, who didn't speak for fear they'd say the wrong thing, who sat in community meetings in hospital gowns, just kind of frozen and, and withdrawn, arrived to our Yom Kippur service dressed beautifully. They had taken off their hospital gown. They put on their finest clothes that they had with them. And they sat with dignity and a sense of anticipation. And as we started, you know, I was very grateful that my mother had my grandmother's prayer book. So I had something to use. As we started and we moved through the prayers, there became this light that was so brilliant in people's eyes. And what struck me most was that as each person, as we went around the circle, participated, they shared in a way that was equal and opposite to their pathology. So the woman who looked and felt and seemed so unworthy leaned forward and said, all people can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. And the man who was known to outburst and had really decked a nurse the other day and was you know, very explosive was the one who rhythmically was singing and really more than anyone leading us through the prayers. Mm -hmm. So in their deep connection to the transcendent relationship, I saw a vibrance, I saw illumination, and I saw a health, a wholeness that completed whatever else had been occluded. And it dawned on me that depression was a prison house, that their, what we called pathology and may well have biological basis and be a medical condition was an occlusion of their whole being. And that that could be resuscitated and renewed in the deepest way through the spiritual part. Okay. So um, thank you for taking us a little bit into these early moments from your career. And I want to jump forward now um, and ask you to tell us about the study that's at the heart of this book. Um, and I do want to say everything you're about to share about the studies it's fascinating and it's groundbreaking, but I also want people to know it's really only one piece of this book, which, which kind of explores in so many different directions, all of which um, I, I think of the study as kind of like the, the hub of the wheel. And then there's a big web uh, spinning out from there, but let's talk about what's at the heart of that wheel now. So having seen patients on an inpatient unit who showed a, really an immediate recovery, for that time being, right? A, a complete wholeness when their spiritual heart was reignited. It occurred to me that spirituality and depression had a deep relationship. Um, and I wanted to know so much how to support the spiritual core, how that interfaced with the developmental path of, of depression and looked first at large epidemiological data sets. As a scientist, I always worked using data sets, measures, publishing in journals that everybody recognized as mainstream because I was trying to bring this understanding of spirituality, mental health recovery into the center. I, science is a tool. And I didn't always know what the answer would be, but I knew that this realm, this constellation was essential to wholeness, thriving and patient recovery. So as we moved along, at the level of epidemiology, which is looking out the airplane window at 10,000 feet, you can see patterns. And the patterns show us that people with a strong spiritual life are 60% less likely to have a recurrence of major depression. I think perhaps most interesting is that there's a whole lifetime course to this path. And that if you look at people mean age 26, those who say my personal spirituality, again, whether Hindu, Jewish, Muslim, spiritual, but not religious. My personal spirituality is my lead foot, is highly important to me. Those people at mean age 26 were two and a half times more likely to have been depressed over the past 10 years. They didn't get there through a bed of roses. They didn't forge this deep spiritual awareness through circumstance. They had struggled through difficult times, loss, pain, and in the depths of despair, where the egg cracks and the floor gives way, they had gone deeper and looked deeper into the deeper, truer nature of life, where they found, ah, I actually am held and loved. Oh, I actually was never alone. Oh, there was a way, even when I felt lost, that I was guided. This deep transcendent awareness was part of their renewal. And once established at mean age 26, was 75% protective against recurrence over the next 10 years. And if they were at high risk, 
based on genes and environment, both, they were 90% protected against recurrence of a major depressive disorder as measured by the DSM. So it was undeniable that spirituality and depression are intertwined. And I wanted to understand how this deep spiritual awareness was formed, the seat of what I call awakened awareness. And I, I call it awakened awareness to stay closely in my lane as a clinical scientist to the seat of perception and not make claims about the fabric of reality as a theologian. So the next step, finally, when we had the cost-effective and um, accessible MRIs was to look at the brain and say, okay, we know that there's a 60% decreased relative risk at the level of a population of spirituality against MDD. And we know that in the life course, our depression opens to a deeper spirituality that once established is protective against recurrence. How does this look in the brain? Well, a team prior to our investigation had identified broad and pervasive regions of cortical thinness, the cortex is processing power in specific regions of the brain that had to do with reflection, perception, and orientation, the occipital, precuneus, and parietal regions. So it seemed to us, well, we're gonna look, we're gonna be comprehensive, but if there is a relationship between spirituality and depression, might there be some trace that is within the band of identified structural differences in depression. And what we found was when we looked at people with a sustained, strong personal spirituality over eight years, there were indeed broad and pervasive regions of cortical thickness in the same areas that would have been not thick, but thin in people with recurrent major depression. And this was based on beautiful data that Myrna Weissman, as the principal investigator of a 40 year longitudinal study over three generations, grandparents, parents, G2, grandchildren, G3, had meticulously followed. Before I had the opportunity to become a scientist, she'd followed these families. So it was a great honor to be able to partner with her, ask these questions first at the epidemiological level and then look into the structure of the brain. And all told that study was perhaps the first to offer evidence that sustained spiritual life is neuroprotective against depression. I, I want to pull out some of the remarkable things that I think you just said and make sure that I'm understanding them correctly. Did I read and am I hearing you say that, um, that the people in the study who showed called the highest levels of spirituality, that those people were more likely to have been and, and considerably more likely to have been depressed prior or to have had significant life struggles prior to yes. entering that other phase. Yes, exactly, exactly. And in this study, the lion's share of that initial, it, it's really almost an initiation of, of Dark Night of the Soul was yeah. middle to late adolescence into emerging adulthood, which in time, other when more studies were done, twin studies and longitudinal twin studies were done, was a time where we discovered as a field of booting up a 50% increase in the heritable contribution to natural spirituality, a booting up from the inside out, a biological clock, a hunger of the heart, a quest and wonder of the head that is absolutely hardwired. So this is our birthright. We, every teen gets depressed. We have sophomore slump because it is an imperative that we dig deep and do the foundational work for the rest of our lives of forming the seat of our awakened brain. So, I mean, those are incredible findings in terms of lending hope as I'm understanding them. These are like jump out of your seat findings. Um, I, I think I, well, I know I shared with you earlier today um, an experience that I had a long time ago um, when I had somebody close to me who was very depressed, who I was quite worried about. And, um, and at the time the book, Listening to Prozac came out and it was talking about the, the promise of SSRIs like Prozac that people up until then hadn't really heard about um, and presenting them with great promise. And it was an, an incredibly thoughtful and well-written book. Um, but aside from the way it was written, I, I, I just remember the experience of like, oh my gosh, okay, you know, there's hope for this person who I love. Um, and I'm hearing your findings 
in an analogous way, but in an incredibly different arena, obviously, from that of psychopharmacology. I, I think I hear you saying that if you are somebody listening tonight who is depressed yourself or who loves somebody who is depressed, that not only can there be a way out, but the way out can be even more shining and expansive than anything you're probably thinking or imagining is possible. Susan, that's so beautifully put. Depression is not the period at the end of the sentence. Depression is a knock at the door for a deepening of our spiritual awareness. It is an awakening opportunity. And in fact, I think there's a developmental imperative at certain chapters that we have to suffer in order to deepen our awareness. Um, but the way we lived yesterday was fine, but it doesn't hold for our expanding almost arc of growth. Um, so I, I think that's very beautifully put. Depression is not, does not make us less. Depression is the opportunity, the invitation to an expansion of our ability to see into life, to be more loving, to be more connected, and to understand life as having a deep nature, meaning it's not just constructed, but revealed in a more lived dialogue with life. Yeah, I mean, I was actually looking down because I was looking to see, I, I had actually um, written down a few of the ways that you put this in the book. And one thing you said was um, that depression and spirituality are two sides of one door. And you also said, depression was not the thing that had obscured my view of the bigger picture, it was the knock on the door. I mean, that's a completely radically different way to understand what depression is and can be. Um, so tell me, like, what do we, and tell, tell everybody, what do we know about how the people in this cohort, um, how did they get from A to B? How did they get from their dark no night of the soul to the place on the other side? Right. Um, and, I, and because, you know, I want to say one thing, which I think will be very helpful to people in this beautiful rendering that you've, you've put forward of the science, which is depression. Okay, let me put it this way. If two very qualified mental health providers sit down separately with someone who has schizophrenia, they agree 90% of the time on the diagnosis. If two very qualified mental health providers sit down separately with someone who has bipolar, they agree seven out of 10 times on the diagnosis. But if they sit down with someone who has depression, only 28% of the time do they agree. And that is because depression, um, as published by the leaders of the, of the DSM, has many different subtypes. And a very large subtype appears to be a developmental depression, an existential delve into life. There are people who have the form of depression where there's an imbalance, a piece is broken, and psychopharm is the answer. And that is, as I look at the data, about one third of the cases. But two thirds of the cases, particularly in young adults, and this scores both with our data and what college counselors tell me, are not psychopathology as a medical illness. They are the developmental depression of reaching into life with existential hunger and trying to figure out one's deep nature and purpose and the ultimate significance of life. This is the most important work of coming of age and it comes back again at midlife. So when this is the opportunity of a lifetime, the last thing we would want to do is foreclose that by through omission, not speaking of spirituality. We want to honor this possibility. In the United States, um, Prozac can be extremely helpful to the one third who will benefit from medical treatment. But 50% of people, over half the people to receive SSRIs do not meet criteria for depression. And over 30% of people meet no diagnosis at all. So there's a tendency to try to jumpstart um, this process of getting better, which can short circuit the development of uh, that we're called to do, the invitation of depression to deepen, to look more fully. And that in the suffering, if it is not an intolerable suffering, but in the struggle is growth, that it's not wasted struggle. It's, it's every day deepening, exploring, understanding life's truer nature. When, to get back to your question, when we invited these folks in this beautiful study by Myrna Weissman, three generations, 40 years into the lab, this time not to go into the 
the MRI machine, but to go and wear a little EEG cap to pick up what's coming off the brain, the energy coming off the brain. What we found was that those people to have recovered from depression through a deepening of spiritual life gave off a wavelength, high amplitude alpha, and it was right here, posterior, high amplitude alpha, where many faith traditions cover the head. Right? High amplitude alpha was given off as well by those people to recover from depression, not through a deepening of spiritual life, but through SSRIs, suggesting that SSRIs jumpstart a use of the brain that might otherwise be achieved through this metabolizing and deepening and the formation of spiritual awareness, the awakened brain. The problem with this road, if it is not a medical depression, but an existential developmental process, is that when the SSRIs go away, so does alpha. And the growth has not had the opportunity. You, we have the opportunity of their lifetime, the patient's lifetime, the young adult's lifetime, the college student's lifetime to support spiritual development. So how has all of this been received in mainstream science? Um, we were talking earlier, well, both tonight, but also earlier today um, about kind of the tradition of skepticism in the field of science, in our culture more broadly. Um, I consider myself quite a skeptic at the same time that I'm really interested in, in spiritual subjects. Um, so it's there in all different ways. And yeah, and, 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 and you talk in your book about how when you first started down this path of scientific research, you were met not just with skepticism, but, but with really kind of painful um, dismissiveness. Where are you now? Where is the field now? Great. So when I started out in the mid nineties, right? Um, this was not seen. There was not a single peer review study in a well-known journal on spirituality, mental health and recovery in the first two decades of life and just the tiniest bit on adults having to do with attendance, religious attendance, but yet to be discovered was the foundational you know, innate capacity of spirituality yet to be discovered where the neural correlates yet to be discovered where's the protective benefits and none of it was there. Um, so we have a scientific method that is clean and clear and rigorous and we have that method pertains both to the interior of the lab, but also to the magnificent peer review process. So it was in my lab, starting out as a postdoc and then building a lab of my own, we always published through the peer review process, which to the great credit of the scientific community is truly not ad hominem, not driven by topic. It is driven by the integrity, the internal integrity of the method and the strength of the claims insofar as they're supported by the data. So I will say that the scientific method worked beautifully, that very new topics were published in American Journal of Psychiatry, JAMA Psychiatry, because the peer review method, blind to who the authors are, and always involving two or three scientists reading and critiquing the paper at least two or three times, produced for both our work and everyone's in the field, a statement that science as a field says this is fact, right? So the method worked beautifully. Now, um, scientists who are very, very good scientists are incredibly curious and can't wait to hear what the finding is. And I found that the senior scientists who supported the work, whether it was through the William T. Grant Foundation or the chairman of my department, were so curious, they almost vibrated like children. They were so excited to find out new things. But the culture, not of science, but of what some people call scientism, can be driven by vogue, can be driven by taste, can be driven by opinion. So the fact that in the 20th century, there were very few, almost no articles in which the scientific method had yet to be applied to live human spirituality, was no fault of the method, the scientists had yet to turn and point the lens, right? So science is a terrific method, but the questions are only as good as the scientist is willing to explore. Right? It turns out that when scientists were actually systematically polled, who'd done breakthrough work, scientists were identified who had contributed in, in meaningful leaps to the field, 70% of those scientists said that their best question came through a dream, 
a synchronicity and inspiration, the proverbial hit on the head by an apple. Mm -hmm. And then of course the method was rigorous and straightforward. So there are scientists who use both intuition, mystical knowing, empiricism, logic, but the culture of the 20th century was not just one of a scientific method. There was an implicit radical secular materialism that kept scientists as a matter of personality taste and vogue from pointing the lens at spiritual questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I was just looking down here at something I had written before tonight, which is, um, this comes from the mythologist Jean, I don't know if you say her name Houston or Houston, but anyway, it looks like the city Houston. Um, and she defines spiritual longing as the core of every human soul. And here's, here's how she puts it. She says, the deepest yearning in every human soul is to return to its spiritual source, there to experience communion and even union with the beloved. And, um, and it seems to me that, that that statement can be true regardless of what God a person does or doesn't believe in, um, whether or not there is a God, the spiritual longing can still be there. Um, and, and that if that statement is true, that all of psychology really should be organized around it. I mean, it's like a, it, it, it's a deep organizing principle of humanity, if what she's saying is right or halfway right even. And yet that's not something that's really talked about in the way that we think about human psychology in the mainstream. Um, so that, and this is, this is a question I've been thinking about a lot, and it's one of the reasons I was so excited about and intrigued by your research, because I think we're getting uh, to a point of exploring these questions, but we're still circling around it. I think our mass suffering right now is so immediate. That traditionally, we think of depression as residing in an individual, maybe a family, and the individual goes for therapy one-on-one, -on -one, or there's a family treatment. 50% of people in our country right now consider themselves depressed. So this is not a matter of individual suffering, but of a whole culture that needs to perhaps welcome depression as a knock at the door to a deepening of awareness and that we could become a more awakened society, how we treat one another, how we show up for one another. You know, the awakened brain, if we look through the fMRI, sees, feels, and knows that we are loved, held, guided, and never alone. There's a bonding network, there's the parietal, there's the attention, things come online in a way that we are able to perceive into life that we are loved, held, guided, and never alone. We can show up for one another as part of that symphony of life, the being the sacred beings we are, being in relationship, a spiritually significant call. So when we talk about the longing, you know, it's done, you know, I think back to the two dimensions that scientists have found of lived human spirituality. There's the deep connection to the sacred, the infinite, and there's that which is sacred and infinite in one another. Um, and I think in both ways, as a society, our mass depression will be a porthole for growth and deepening and transformation when we avail ourselves of both those forms of our birthright. What do we say to someone, and this is going to be my last formal question because I am aware of time marching on and um, I want to make sure that everyone out there has a chance to ask you their questions. Um, but what do, I'm thinking of someone in particular who I know who um, had a really terrible childhood, completely devoid of love and full of abuse um, and has remarkably grown up to be an incredibly loving person, but... Um, but not somebody who's been able to have primary love relationships in his own life yeah. um, and who suffers from that tremendously um, and, and suffers from the memory of that past, which he can't shake. And, um, and, and this is someone who, who is a very deeply, naturally spiritual person, but he's still really struggling. And what do you say to him? Mm. He might even be listening tonight. I don't know. Well, he sounds like a very big-hearted person Yeah, who holds and is capable of great love. And so 
Um, my hope for him is that he encounters people who are able to love unconditionally, to see him into being as the beautiful soul on earth he is, to help him know himself, experience himself as the infinite, sacred, whether we say child of God or being of life itself, by simply seeing him fully into existence. Um, there is a level when our spiritual core is formed that is transcendent, and there's a level where we are ambassadors onto one another, and how we see each other, how we speak to each other, what we do for one another ennobles us into really our true birthright. So that is my hope for him, that he is seen and known for who he really is. Is there, if there were just one practice we could suggest to him, is there anything you would recommend? Hmm. Well, something that I've, I've done with people um, that they love is to sit with someone, it can be following a time of conflict, but it could also just be, let's do this now um, as an affirmation. And um, we say, I love you because, and we bear witness to each other. I love you because, and sometimes it's because of something you've done. Sometimes it's because of something you are, um, but I love you because um, it, it is remarkable how people come forward and do all that they I love you because Susan, you are so kind and encouraging and care about the betterment of the world. I love you because no matter how painful it is in the world, you're going to carry a torch of light and possibility. You know, we see each other for who we really are. And the whole relationship shifts to our truer, deeper nature, that we are all souls on earth, children of God, emanations of life itself. So how we show up for each other is how we can become all of who we are, how we show up for each other is how we're going to get through our mass collective post-pandemic depression. Thank you, Lisa. Um, okay, I have a million more questions I could ask you, but not a million more minutes. So I'm going to open this up now to our great audience. And um, I think Dana is going to let us know what the questions are. Yes, we do have questions rolling in here from our audience. And for those of you that have questions, there is the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen there. You can send them on in. Um, one question we have here, are we human beings who occasionally have spiritual experiences or spiritual beings who occasionally have human experiences? I have a monoist perspective. I would say we are spiritual human beings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are you know, body, mind, soul are one. Um, and it is foundational to our human nature that we are inherently spiritual human beings, that we can see into life at a deep, sacred, transcendent level and imminent level and make every choice in such a way, certainly every significant choice that toggles between this deep seat of awakened awareness and the more instrumental form of awareness. I call it achieving awareness, but achieving awareness alone, being skillful, being strategic, being tactical um, is not exhaustive, is not the limits of being human. To be human is to be both achieving oriented, pragmatic and awakened. And when we toggle and use both our awakened awareness and our achieving awareness, and we look into the MRI, we see that highways are built between regions of the brain, myelinated tracks, allowing us to realize the fullness of our nature as spiritual human beings. Can we see depression when being experienced by a person as a unique personalized universal gift to them in that it provides them a key to an equally personalized transcendent place? What a beautiful question. It is so beautifully posed. My simple answer is yes, yes. Um, can you tell us about overcoming religious trauma? Mm. Yes. So. Um, something I've seen is that very often um, the messengers have not walked the walk. And so in the formation of spiritual awareness, um, their ambassadors, our parents, our, the 10,000 exchanges at school each day, the pastor, priest, and mom, our teachers. And when the message of a faith tradition is not upheld or when this deep, deep spiritual nature that is universal, when we look in the MRI, it's the same, whether I'm Catholic, Jewish, Hindu, spiritual, or, or not religious, this deep seat of spiritual awareness is not forthcoming or even is violated. Then the messenger, um, the ambassador can be extremely confusing and even 
be part of occluding or, or stamping down the natural spiritual awareness of the child or the teen. Um, very often people who are angry at a faith tradition are angry at a messenger. They smell hypocrisy or worse. So the renewal, you know, when that happens, often the faith tradition is rejected and the spiritual baby is thrown out with the bathwater. And there's what I call spiritual injury, feeling cut off from our natural capacity for awakened awareness. Um, the healing of that often has to do with realizing the messenger was a foibled human being. The messenger was not the face of the higher power, God, Hashem, Allah. The messenger was not an embodiment of truth. The messenger was a foibled human being who did not live, who did not walk the walk of a spiritual message. That is very helpful. And uh, I'll give you an example. Beautiful story. There was a woman who grew up in a faith community that she loved very much. This was a woman who you know, had grown up in a small town, attended every weekend, loved her tradition, loved the people, the elders, the other children. And when at 17, she became pregnant, the faith community ostracized her. And it was a deep, deep, deep wound to her heart. It felt like a deep rejection by those people who had raised her. And not only that, because they were the ambassadors, the torchbearers of her faith life, it caused spiritual injury where she felt cut off from God as she knew God. Well, she came to term, she gave birth to the baby, asked the clergy if they would please baptize her child, her daughter, who had just you know, opened her life with joy, her beautiful new daughter. The clergy person said no, because the child was born outside of marriage. <clears throat> so who came to the rescue? Grandma. Grandma came, drove 11 hours, picked up the baby and baptized the baby in the ocean. Mm. Lots of sacred water there. And in that renewed for her granddaughter, well, her and the, her great granddaughter, right? Of a, a spiritual life. So who are we to one another? We are restorative. We are agents of spiritual, we can't, we're torchbearers, but we can also injure each other. And we need to be mindful of that within a collective, whether it's the Minya Sangha, congregation, anywhere. We are torchbearers, but we can also injure each other. And every relationship carries both what we call the interpersonal and the relationally spiritual. I love that story so much. I'm, I'm just going to add to it super quickly that um, in, if you haven't found your torchbearer yet, um, you, you can look for that connection in other ways. I mean, you can often find it in music and in nature and in places that are really not at all associated with any kind of formal religious tradition. And I think that can be a really helpful way to reconnect. I have a comment here saying, thank you. I so have much. one more thing about Susan's good point. In the early days of my class at Columbia, I teach a class for 20 years on spirituality and psychology. In the early days, it was before spirituality was center culture. It was the musicians who came. And they would often say, you know, for me, in my music, I feel profound spirituality. Words don't really work for me. They don't, they aren't as powerful. Um, so I, I want to dovetail with what you're saying. And many people say that the forest is my cathedral. So spiritual, but not religious is every bit as still spiritual. Yeah. Um, comment from one of our listeners. Thank you so much, Lisa. I had a spiritual experience as a 13 year old, never talked about it until later in life. This experience informed my life and has given me great peace of mind as I've navigated through life's trials and tribulations. Um, you mentioned Lisa depression often or typically occurring in adolescence and then again in midlife. Can you say more about this pattern? Now these are, if you look across traditions and look across time, and then also look across twin studies, these are periods of accelerated spiritual growth. They are times of a deepening of the expansion of the vessel, if you will. So from mid-adolescence to late adolescence to emerging adulthood, and then again, the bridge at midlife. We, you know, just as at midlife, my hair might grow gray and my face might take on features, so too my soul, right? We grow 
in our spiritual life as we grow hand in hand in our physical life and mature hand in hand. So what this means very often is that the booting up of an augmented spiritual capacity can at moments feel like great illumination and transcendence, but at other moments can feel like a half empty glass of spirituality, an existential hunger unfulfilled. In puberty, it can sound like, you know, what is my meaning? What is my purpose? Actually, what is the meaning, the ultimate purpose? You know, is, does God exist? Is there a transcendent, intelligent, guiding force in life? Everything you've ever told me, mom and dad, is it really true? And this process of testing all that I've been told and all that I might be investigating against my the inner resonance of my heart is a process of coming of age. It's spiritual individuation, the me and not me of spiritual truth. Well, in the beautifully designed family, the teen is often parented by someone at midlife and everyone has skin in the game. This can be shared. And a midlife you know, question I might have is, have I served life? Have I served God? Have I served my higher power to the fullest of my ability? Have I really lived up to my spiritual values? Have I been the type of parent? Have I adopted a profession that I think really does better the human community or the earth community? So these are again, existential questions. And it turns out that at midlife, the more spiritually oriented someone's been, the more awakened over the past couple decades, the harder these questions are at 50 or 55, that the greater the vessel or the, the larger, the, the stronger, the spiritual life, the bigger the fall, that deeply devoted people will feel emptiness and struggle. The dark night of the soul comes again at midlife. Now our culture has really given this short shrift by calling it midlife crisis in the same way we call sophomore slump, some sort of you know amorphous idea of coming of age. The spiritual underpinning of this process is essential because through the lens of science, the spiritual perception is the superordinate from which follows social, moral, and ethical life. Um, you see that if we ignore this in midlife, we can very often become depressed. We can make depression-oriented, depressogenic type decisions that affect other people's lives. But the most common defense is narcissism, that I may feel unworthy and small, so I pump up and I act all that. And it can take form in very destructive behavior that affects other people. So addressing spiritual growth is foundational to assuming the mantle at each phase of life. Um, we just have so many questions rolling in here and they're all fantastic. Um, can I ask one of Susan? <laughs> Go for it. So, I was so delighted to discover that we've been working in parallel universes. And Susan has been thinking deeply into some of these questions through her own field. And I'm wondering if you might just share a bit. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. I don't want to take away from all these questions coming in, but I'll just uh, I'll just tell you uh, briefly that um, so I have a new book that's coming out in April. Um, it's called Bittersweet how longing and sorrow make us whole. So you'll immediately hear in the title, the kind of parallels between Lisa's work and mine. Um, and, and this book actually started because of a lifelong experience that I've had when listening to minor key and sad music. Um, I found myself I mean, feeling the sadness of it, but not really like feeling much more um, a sense of uplift and almost a kind of ecstatic feeling that I couldn't really explain or understand. Um, and, and this became, I, I've been thinking about this question for decades and it sounds, it even sounded to me at, the, at first as a kind of small localized question that you wouldn't write a whole book about, but it actually became a whole kind of um, spiritual inquiry. And, you know, it started with like looking at Aristotle um, who asked this question of, well, why is it, he said 2000 years ago, um, why is it that so many of the great poets and philosophers and even politicians have had a melancholy dis melancholic disposition? Um, and I think of myself as a kind of happy melancholic, like I'm not depressed, but I tend to melan melancholy in my just way of thinking and being. Um, and I started really just like chasing this trail across the centuries because it turns out that artists and writers and 
thinkers and now psychologists and scientists have been thinking about this, this question of why melancholy and what is it and what is the special essence that is at the soul of, of a melancholic sensibility. Um, and I actually came up with this kind of, um, I call it a bittersweet scale. It's like a quiz that you can take that measures your tendency to be bittersweet in this way. Um, we've done extremely preliminary studies so far with the cognitive science uh, scientists, Scott Barry Kaufman and um, David Yadin at Johns Hopkins. Um, and it's been really interesting. Like they, they've found that, um, that people who score high in this bittersweet tendency also tend to be higher, high scorers in creativity. Um, they tend to feel readily awe and wonder and transcendence and spirituality. And there's also a small correlation with anxiety and depression. So, you know, it's this whole constellation that's so close to everything that Lisa has been looking at in a completely different realm. Um, so it's so beautiful. It's beautiful because depression is a gateway to a deepening of yeah. spiritual life, right? They are using their awakened brain, right? And of all, you know, um, the spirit, the awakened capacity is independent of every different type of personality, right? If you look at the five big personality types, except for one dimension, which is openness to experience. And indeed right. is the artists and the shamans and the creatives and those who look at life through an awakened brain are also more likely to have times of depressiveness, right? They go hand in hand. And so um, a creative response to life, a creative response to trauma, a creative response to disappointment or depression is an awakened response. It is an opportunity to reshuffle our lives in a way that is so much bigger and so much more wonderful than we might've ever anticipated on the other side. Yeah. Day. And yet at the same time, we've, I, by the way, I just realized I'd forgotten my mic before. So I hope you could all hear all that. But anyway, um, just to say, yeah, and we're living with this culture that's telling us you should be super cheerful all the time. And if you're not cheerful, you know, you can be righteously outraged. You can have those emotions, but you can't be sad. You can't be melancholic. You can't think about or speak about heavy things. It's unseemly somehow. And I think that's part of what's making us depressed. We shouldn't, it, it's, a, it's a real diminishment of human experience. It's, it's so, so interesting. I interviewed a, a young man in Utah about 15 years ago. And he said, you know, I have so many existential questions. And he would often be in this sort of dysthymic state when I have so many questions, but it's when I don't think about them that I get most depressed, that there is a press from within them. It's a, a thrust of life that asks us to expand and be full, whole spiritual beings. And when we damper it or ignore it, we get depressed. So saying no to the knock at the door is more depressing than to say, yes, yes come in depression. Yeah. Yep. Well, this is so fascinating. And I know we can go on for the rest of the night. We're at time, but I do wanna ask one last question before we close. Um, when our readers go and get the awakened brain and they purchase your new beautiful book, what do you hope <laughs> overall um, that they take away from this? That their suffering is, does not make them less. Suffering makes us more if we say yes to the invitation. That half our country is depressed, but if we let in those feelings and acknowledge depression, not as a pothole in our lives, but as really a porthole. And, and as we journey through this porthole, we are supported, we are loved, we are guided, we can draw into a closer alignment with the deeper nature of life. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. If you look at research, pain and growth can often go hand in hand, but we are growing and we are loved. And on the other side of the tunnel, where the journey ends is, magnificent i mean it is narnia it is beautiful <laughs> thank you both thank you dr miller thank you susan this has been such a lovely evening um for joining us tonight for this discussion it's been a pleasure and honor to host you happy book birthday again Lisa. Thank you. And to all of our guests, thank you for joining us. And as always, thank you for um, supporting your local independent bookstores. It means the absolute world to us. 
Don't forget The Awakened Brain by Dr. Lisa Miller is out now and available for purchase in store or online. Um, Until next time, happy reading all and have a fantastic night.